In February 1945, it seemed that the European war was nearly over. The Allied armies had reached the Rhine, but here they halted, faced with the greatest river obstacle in Western Europe. If they could cross the Rhine, their war was won. The problem was how to cross it and where. Since Arnhem, the Anglo-American staffs had revised their plans for the final battle of the West. This battle was to end with the surrender of Germany, but it had to begin with the crossing of the Rhine. The Germans have always looked on the Rhine as a great barrier against invasion. From its source in Switzerland, as far as Cologne, the river is narrow, but it runs between high ranges of hills. A bridgehead in the south, such as the Americans won at Remagen, could be of great nuisance value, but no more. Then north of Cologne, the river is more than a quarter of a mile wide. But here the country through which it runs is flat and suitable for fast mechanized forces. What's more, this area offers the greatest strategic advantages to an army invading Germany. So the stretch of the Rhine between Rees and Wesel was chosen for the first crossings. The code name given to these crossings was Operation Plunder. In order to bring the maximum weight of troops to bear in the bridgehead area as quickly as possible, and to seize vital positions in the rear of the enemy, the Allies planned the largest single airborne landing of the war, Operation Varsity. Now, for a last run over the 21 Army Group plan for the Rhine crossing, it consists of two closely coordinated operations. First, Operation Plunder, the crossing of the Rhine. That consists of three staggered assaults. 30 Corps cross near Rees. Then, 1st Commando Brigade crosses near Basel, and 12 Corps opposite Xanten. Those crossings take place on the night 23rd, 24th March, and at the same time, the American 9th Army is crossing south of Basel. Then comes Operation Varsity, the airborne assault. At 10 o'clock the following morning, the American 18th Airborne Corps, consisting of the American 17th Airborne Division and ourselves, the 6th British Airborne Division, arrive on the enemy gun area, which, if you look at it on the model, is this area here, behind the woods, with the object of disrupting the enemy defences and capturing the crossings over the River Issel. These three crossings here, which on the model are here. Now, you'll appreciate that we are coming in slap on top of the enemy defences. And to do that, three para brigade flies in first to this area with the object of capturing the high wooded feature there. Then five para brigade come in onto this area in order to protect the whole divisional area from the north. And then last, six air landing brigade in their gliders by battalions to capture those crossings over the Issel and the village of Hamilkeln. To ensure the success of the operation, all the forces involved had to undergo training beforehand. The vital importance of accuracy on the intended drop necessitated a short refresher course on parachuting technique. As the plan provided for tactical landings on selected objectives in ten separate areas, it was essential that each stick of parachute troops and each glider should be landed within a few hundred yards of its target. The glider pilot regiment, which had suffered heavy losses at Arnhem, was reinforced with RAF pilots. Each had to learn not only how to fly a glider, but also how to fight as a soldier.
from a force comprising over 3,000 aircraft and gliders. Two divisions were to be dropped in two hours. To ensure precise timing and execution, the crews of each aircraft and the glider pilots had to receive special instruction. After the completion of preliminary training, a combined exercise was carried out to ensure the proper coordination of all the forces engaged. By the middle of March, the training of the 7,200 men of the Airborne Division was finished. Their battle equipment included 115 motorcycles, 250 jeeps and trailers, 66 field and anti-tank guns, three tanks, and even two bulldozers. On March 21st, D-Day minus three, the air crews were briefed on their order of flight and their route to the Rhine. Throughout their flight, they'd be protected by fighters. And on their arrival, they'd find the German airfields and flak positions had been attacked in advance by heavy bombers and by the second tactical air force. From 11 airfields in Britain, the RAF and US Army Air Corps were to carry the 6th British Airborne Division. The 17th US Airborne Division was to take off from 15 airfields in France and join the British component over the small Belgian town of Vavre, codenamed Marfac on the map. At the point codenamed Yalta, the two forces were to diverge and make for their appointed landing areas beyond the Rhine. This then was the plan for Operation Varsity. Meanwhile in Germany, under cover of a colossal smoke screen, 21 Army Group had made its preparations. All along the west bank of the Rhine, British and American forces were standing by, awaiting the order to cross. Beyond the Rhine, the attacks on the German Air Force were still going on. On the afternoon of March 23rd, the artillery barrage began. It continued throughout the night. The town of Wesel on the east bank was the enemy's main strong point in the area of the intended bridgehead. During the night, it was attacked by Bomber Command with such accuracy that commandos who'd crossed the river in advance witnessed the bombing in perfect safety from positions only a thousand yards from the town. Basel was demolished. By dawn of March 24th, crossings in force by 21 Army Group had been proceeding smoothly for several hours. Then, at 0600 hours, the first of the airborne troops took off from England.
fighter escort was a welcome sight to the crews of the lumbering transports and gliders. But so effective had been the previous week's air offensive against the German airfields that not one enemy aircraft was encountered throughout the journey. From their airfields in France came the 17th US Airborne Division, an aircraft and gliders of 9th Troop Carrier Command. Over the town of Bavre, the two airborne processions joined forces. By now, the stream of aircraft stretched from one horizon to the other. Just before 1000 hours, the leading aircraft reached the Rhine. At 1000 hours, amid the clouds of smoke and dust from bombed vessel, the first paratroops went down to secure the landing areas. Although the landing areas were not easy to find in the smoke and haze, the entire 6th Airborne Division was landed in 63 minutes. Landing conditions were bad and caused heavy casualties among the glider pilots, and the slow-flying Dakotas were easy targets for the German ground gunners. first glider landing, the airborne troops had occupied the village of Hammenkel and had captured the bridges over the Issel intact. Within another hour, all positions had been consolidated and prisoners were streaming in.
During the morning, liberators of the U.S. 8th Air Force dropped a further day's supplies to the two airborne divisions. By 13.30 hours, the 6th British Airborne Division had captured all its objectives. The bridgehead was secure, and 21 Army Group had linked with the airborne forces. Then began the race across Germany. The 6th British Airborne Division was the first Allied division to reach the Baltic, where they met the Red Army at Wismar on May the 2nd. Only 43 days after the landing of the first paratroop on Jahannenkelm came the dramatic climax, the unconditional surrender of the entire northern group of German armies to Field Marshal Montgomery, a victory hastened by the skillful planning and smooth execution of the greatest Allied airborne landing of the war, Operation Varsity.